This is the CRE Weekly Digest by Lightbox, a firm transforming the commercial real estate landscape by connecting every step of the CRE process with comprehensive tools and data. I'm Martha Kocher with Manis Clancy and Diane Crocker, and this is a special guest podcast covering the CRE lending market. Our guest, Jamie Woodwell, is head of the Commercial Real Estate Research and Mortgage Bankers Association, where he oversees MBA research and related activities covering commercial and multifamily real estate markets. Jamie, your work is regularly cited in the media. We see you all over the place. You go up to Capitol Hill, you're on CNBC, Bloomberg, and other trade press. So we're excited to hear what you have to say today. Super excited to be here. So let's start with something that's an easy one. What are you hearing from your members these days? It's a great question. We're hearing a lot from a lot of different members. I think there's a lot of uncertainty. There has been a lot of uncertainty in the markets about sort of where we go from here. But what we're generally hearing is across capital sources, lenders are ready, willing, able, and eager to be making loans. They're looking for loans that make sense and can command the loan dollars for that property. It, it's a it's a place where I think you've got a little bit more in terms of lending capacity than being as tapped into right now from the market. But overall, I think you, you've got a pretty positive group of lenders, again, looking to put their money at work. Well, that's comforting to hear, Jamie. Let me first thank you for being here. I, I enjoyed hearing you speak at Crew Network's convention in Vancouver, and we really appreciate you accepting our invite to be here. Thanks for having me. I liked the answer to your last question because I am hearing from a lot of Lightbox's clients that their own lender clients are still really reluctant to lend. But I wanted to ask you, we had a podcast guest a few weeks ago, someone you might know, Brian Olasoff, and he said something that really stuck with me. His position was that it's at the bottom of every crisis that banks should start lending. But in previous downturns like the GFC, it took three years after the recession for CMBS delinquency rates to hit bottom. Today, he sees it as a lender's market with eager borrowers scrambling for capital and, and that lenders can really be price givers and borrowers the price takers. Now, he said, is the time when banks can really get in and make great, durable loans under pretty attractive terms, even at a time when they might be a bit preoccupied with dealing with the wave of maturities. And it sounds like from the answer you just gave that you agree with Brian, that you are seeing an appetite to lend and that banks are eager to loosen the reins a bit. Is that true? We, we are seeing an appetite to lend. And I think, you know, it's it's interesting. Sometimes when you see, see say, total the total amount of mortgage originations drop off, that's looked at as a sign of the capital sources sort of turning the spigot off and not making capital available. I think what you've seen particularly over the last two years is is really the the flip side of that, that you haven't seen borrowers looking to do deals that for a whole variety of reasons we can talk about, property owners have been sitting on their hands. You haven't seen a lot of sales transaction activity. People who haven't really been forced to finance or were sort of holding off for a variety of reasons. And even those who are hitting maturities were looking for ways to extend that loan out. And so lenders have been in a place where they know what their cost of funds is. They they are looking to see what properties can support in terms of debt service payments and those types of things. And I think they've generally been there throughout this cycle. It's just that the, the borrowers stepping up with loans or loan loan requests that meet those demands haven't been nearly what they were in, in previous years. Let me pivot for a second, Jamie. And talk about the the sentiment at the banks. We've had some real scares in the last 18 months. We had Silicon Valley Bank. We had the deposit run concerns, right, after Silicon Valley Bank. And then we went through a six-month cycle where every bank CEO seemed to have to go on to CNBC and talk about their office exposure, right? That was a big thing. What is making banks, in your opinion, more confident? Is that just time has healed those risks or is it something more to it? If one singles out the banks in particular, right, there, there are a variety of different capital sources out there for commercial real estate. You've got the banks, which are account for about 38% of commercial mortgage debt outstanding. You've got Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You've got the life company, CMBS, investor-driven lenders. But, but looking just at the banks, um, as you mentioned, there were, there were some bank failures a year and a half plus ago that really got a lot of attention focused on the banking sector. As often happens when there are challenges, everyone immediately said, well, what about commercial real estate at banks, even though those failures had nothing to do with commercial real estate? 
But given everything going on in the office market and elsewhere, investors, regulators, everyone's antennas, antenna were tuned. So a lot of focus came to commercial real estate, as you mentioned, and you saw banks putting out earning statements where before they would hardly mention commercial real estate or it would be a footnote on page 27, page three or four was a deep dive into their commercial real estate exposure, really trying to communicate to investors where things really stood as opposed to where the headlines were. And you've seen working through of that o- over the last 18 months of banks working to educate regulators, educate investors about where things stand. Again, like 4,000 banks out there. So it's, it's hard to generalize about what's going on in any particular bank. You did see a distinction between the top 25 banks and sort of the rest of the market in how they process this, where the those top 25 banks, again, partly because of regulator scrutiny, partly because of investor scrutiny, really pushed on their their commercial real estate exposure. Lots of information going out through earning statements. You saw those banks digging deep into their portfolios, identifying loans, particularly office loans that may not be in great shape going forward, even if they were continuing to pay now, marking those as non-current, taking charge-offs, and really, in a lot of ways, working to get that behind them so that they could say, that's in the rear view and now we're ready to move forward. And I, I think we're at that point now where a lot of those banks have come back into the market, have sort of socked away a fair amount in terms of allowance for loan losses for their office portfolio loans. Smaller banks, you haven't seen that same level of marking of loans of non-current or of charging off office loans. It's kind of interesting to think through how much of that is because they're not seeing the same investor or regulator scrutiny and how much is because they've got just very different types of assets that the big banks tend to have the larger office loans, the smaller banks, smaller office loans. And there have been a number of studies that sort of focus the greater risk on those larger loans in the office world. So a lot going on there. If you if you look at the bank holdings, over that period, you've seen the larger banks through their actions, seeing their overall commercial real estate portfolios shrinking a little bit in the last two years. If you look at the smaller banks or, you know, the not top 25 banks in aggregate, they've actually continued to grow their commercial real estate holdings over this whole period. So again, lots going on underneath the surface with 4,000, you know, plus institutions out there. That makes me want to ask, what do you think of a lot of the alarmist headlines we've had? And there's variations of them in this lending world. The latest we saw was an analysis regarding the Fed looking at CRE risk. And I think one of the headlines was New York Fed says banks are obscuring commercial real estate risk by extending loan terms. That's from a study out of the New York Fed from some of the folks there. It's it's interesting if you dig down into it, into what the paper really gets into. And so I'd recommend folks dig into it. What's kind of interesting is that the takeaway many people are getting from that paper is actually directly counter to guidance from the FDIC and the Fed that banks are asked by their regulators to work with borrowers and sort of not to preemptively create challenges by forcing a maturity or or other things on a loan if the underlying fundamentals of that property continue to support that loan. I think there's always been a lot of focus on the extensions. You know, if you go back before the global financial crisis, I remember sort of the mantra being for lenders and servicers, your first loss is your best loss. That if a, a loan runs into trouble, just go ahead, bite the bullet, work through it. And if you have to take a loss, take a loss. During the GFC, then there was a move towards extensions in a lot of different parts of the market. And they ended up very well in most cases. You know, lenders, servicers, when when they come across a loan or a property that might be facing challenges, the particulars of that deal are really important. And so they dig down into that particular property, that particular borrower, and what's in the best interest of the deal going forward. If you look at where the last year and a half or so, the broad expectations have been that interest rates would drop. Sort of think back to the spring of 2023, interest rates were at 4.7-ish percent. Pretty much universally, the expectation was that we'd be seeing rates in the threes by the time we got to 2024. 
And that meant that for a whole lot of loans that were sort of facing maturities in 2023, if rates came down, that would be a good tailwind for that property and help out in the refinancing or sort of next life for that property. And sure enough, you know, rates came down in the third quarter of this year, and we saw a burst of activity in terms of mortgage originations as a lot of borrowers took advantage of that to go ahead and refinance their loans. Rates have since bounced back up. And I think this is a place where now borrowers, investors, lenders are sort of looking at the situation and thinking, if we had the case back a year ago where the broad expectations were that rates were going to come down and that was going to help the situation, that's not as clear today that those long-term rates are going to be coming down. Short end of the curve is a different story. But as a result, that balance between go ahead and working through any challenges that might be out there now versus sort of seeing where things go in a year with some commitment from the borrower, it's constantly evolving. And again, lenders, servicers, others are always working through what's in the best interest of that deal going forward to, to manage that. And that's what makes it so difficult to forecast commercial real estate lending right now because the market is so uncertain and it's changing so fast. So as year end approaches, Jamie, I start gathering data nuggets from the market and, and thinking about what sources like the MBA are going to come out with in terms of forecast, not just for Q4, but for next year. Q3 data showed commercial and multifamily mortgage originations that rose 59% year on year, 44% quarter on quarter. So two questions. That was the third quarter, which you talked about. You know, Obviously, the market saw a burst of activity when rates finally did come down for the first time in September. But what drove that significant growth in Q3? Was it just growth over a pretty low baseline? Was it the drop in yield on the one-year treasury that we saw last summer? And then second, if the drop in yield drove that Q3 lending growth, what does that mean in terms of what you expect to see for Q4, where we do have two rate cuts now, but there's also a lot of uncertainty? Forecasting on commercial mortgage originations is is right up there for me with putting in my NCAA basketball pool. There's just a lot of uncertainty out there. There are a lot of different things that are gonna end up driving it. When we put together our forecast, what we've seen historically is that mortgage originations move right in line with property values and changes in property values. What tends to be tied to that closely is interest rates so that we, we can see that as a big driver as well. And I think in Q3 of this year, those interest rates were absolutely a key factor, that when you think about um, the loans that were set to mature in 2024 and coming off of a number being extended from 2023, there was a lot. There's $930 billion of commercial mortgages set to mature in 2024 as of the end of 2023. Uh, and so some of those were just waiting for the right time. And the drop in long-term treasury yields for, for loans that are priced off of that was a great opportunity. And it pulled a lot of borrowers off the sidelines into it. Interestingly, we didn't see the same pop in investment sales activity that we did in originations, where I think sales, a, a lot of folks are still sort of holding on, trying to figure out where property values are, that sort of a thing. So then thinking about Q4, I think Q4 originations will have some loans that were teed up in Q3 coming to fruition in Q4. And then also we do have those maturities. And to the degree that borrowers, investors, lenders aren't expecting for the world to get sort of better in terms of interest rates or other things over the next year or so, that probably gets more to stand up and act now than to wait for for some change in situation. It is interesting. We've got the long end of the curve sort of back up in the fours at this point. But then on the short end of the curve, there are broad expectations that the Fed is going to be cutting the Fed funds rate and that'll be bringing down short term rates over the next year. A lot of questions about where that ends up where the Fed ends up in those moves and the path to get there, that will help the shorter term rates in borrowing somewhat. So there's a little bit of a balance there. And, and we've seen people making choices in the types of loans they want to take out based on where those two different rates are. Makes sense. So it sounds like any forecast has to come with a long list of caveats and a timestamp because the market's changing so fast. That's right. And I think it's, a, it, it, it's like anything you get in the supermarket, best if used by, right? In the beginning, Jamie, at the beginning of our conversation, you talked about enthusiasm to deploy capital, that it's out there for your members, which are plentiful. And as you said, uh, they span 
private equity and banks and insurance companies and, and others that are doing this. If you had to break the market into kind of two types of, of lenders, where would you draw the line? Are people who are eager to deploy thinking, I got to get in before rates fall further. It's a good time now. I don't want to be left behind in this market and find out a year from now that I could have made a 5% or a 6% handle loan and now I'm making 3% handle loans like I was doing in 2021. Or is it more confidence in the economy that they're getting pricing power because the problems in commercial real estate are overblown and they have an opportunity to pick up market share? How would you divide that line between those two thought processes among your lenders? Yeah, yeah, let me get to that. And it's it's interesting. Like I think the the pricing power, the concept of pricing power for lenders right now, again, there's there's a fair amount of competition out there from lenders. They're they're competing against one another to get that loan out. Different capital sources, different lender sources have different buckets of funds that they're investing. So, you know, the banks have their deposits that they're investing, the the life insurance companies have the um, life insurance premiums or annuity payments or other things. CMBS investors are looking at whether to buy a CMBS bond or a corporate bond or something else. So each one of them has a variety of different places where they could put their money and commercial mortgages are competing with that. And so you sort of think about the commercial mortgages as a relatively known entity. Each of those capital sources has been doing this for decades, if not centuries. They know the types of loans they underwrite. They know the terms. They've got a good sense of how they perform over time. And so it really comes down to win that loan in the market, competing against other lenders, sort of what's available in terms of yield. And then how does that compare to other places that that bank or life company or security investor could be putting their money? And traditionally, commercial mortgages have performed very well relative to other investment options. And so that's where those different investors are going. And life companies, they've, they've got their, um, their books of business and they, they know the parameters and they're competing against corporate bonds or equities. And so the commercial mortgage has to show a good yield relative to those. And I think they are. Similar banks are looking across commercial and industrial loans, consumer loans, other places to put their funds. And commercial mortgages have been a great asset for them through the years. So, you know, I, I don't think that there's a lot of those lenders who are really trying to time the market. I think they're always looking to put their funds to use in the most advantageous way. And commercial mortgages are a place that has served them well. Jimmy, let's dig a little bit into some of the analysis that your organization has done. You released your Q3 data and there's a lot that's unique about the CRE lending market right now. Why don't you walk us through some of that? You know, there, there's a variety of different things, and we're tracking in our data mortgage originations, loan maturities, mortgage debt outstanding, loan performance, and really interesting times in all of those. Our Q3 mortgage originations numbers showed that borrowing and lending was up in Q3, driven, I think, a fair amount by the drop in long term rates at that point. You saw pickups during the quarter among every capital source. Over time, if you look back further, the last year and a half, we've been in a bit of the doldrums in terms of mortgage borrowing and lendings. 2023 volumes were about half of what 2022's volumes were. First half of this year was flat to that slow start to 2023. So the pickup in, in Q3 was, was sort of both a welcome and, and an expected sign. You know, we've been expecting this log jam to break as we've had a fair number of loan maturities out there and have been sort of waiting for borrowers and lenders and servicers to be here now and, and start to act. So a lot of that was expected. Among different capital sources, you have seen a real pickup in some parts of the markets. CMBS, single asset, single borrower deals, the very big floating rate deals backed by one portfolio or one property really have been going gangbusters this year. The investor-driven lenders, private credit has seen a big pickup this year versus last. Banks, a uh, bit slower, actually down a little bit for this year and the GSEs as well. So different sectors, but all of that really still waiting on the borrowers to come up and, and create demand for that mortgage capital. And we do expect that to be coming over the next coming quarters and years. It'll be bumpy. Interestingly, Q1 of the year is always the slowest quarter. Commercial mortgage borrowing and lending sort of ramps up as the year goes along. Uh, so wouldn't expect to see a whole lot of indications of how 2025 will fare as a year in the first quarter. 
but over the course of the year, do expect things to ramp up. But again, a lot of different things driving that activity. One of the things that I remember you saying at Crew Network Convention was that with the differentiation in the market today, that you really can't paint with broad brushstrokes. Specifically, of course, office is on everybody's buying these days. So I wonder if you could speak a bit to your thoughts on the office sector and, and what you see happening there. Yeah, sure. And to your point, when you look at the market as a whole, there's $4.7 trillion of commercial mortgage debt outstanding. If you read the headlines, so sort of all of that is office loans on the balance sheets of small and mid-sized banks. Nothing could be further than the truth. It's a big, diverse market. Two trillion of the four point seven trillion is multifamily, probably about seven hundred billion is office, a lot of variety out there. And then when you look within the different property types, you get just a ton of variety across markets and submarkets, property types, property subtypes, borrower types, vintages. So every property is really different. And I think that's something we're we're seeing now start to come through on office. That if you look at retail back a couple of years ago. It was sort of tarnished and investors, lenders were shying away from retail and sort of putting all retail in one bucket. They've since really been able to differentiate. And now some parts of retail are the most sought after loans out there. When you look at office, you have a similar situation where the onset of the pandemic and questions about hybrid work, changes in how offices are being used really led to people shying away from office as an investment or a lending. There's just too much uncertainty and we can get into a lot of uncertainty remains. But what we are starting to see, I think, is that investors and lenders are starting to be able to differentiate properties that they really cannot feel good about, properties that they really can feel good about, and then a mix in the middle where there's just not enough for them now to get their arms around on that property. And so that that beginning to to break the logjam on office, I think, is really important and means that number of office buildings are now able to get investment dollars, equity, and or debt there. But but there still is a lot of uncertainty. You know, if you if you think about the generational or even bigger changes that the pandemic brought to the way we work, we're still working through that. Individual companies and their employees are still working through what their relationship is going to be with the office. That's probably going to take another few years. That then needs to roll into their next lease decisions. And still 40 plus percent of the leases in place were pre-pandemic leases. So a lot of that still needs to churn. And then that needs to roll up to individual properties and see sort of how the properties are faring with the lease decisions that are made. That's going to take a while, still take a few years to roll through. And it's not all negative. Some of the elements of that are going to be positive. We've seen employment growth. We've seen businesses that need more desks than they need before. So we'll see how all that balances out. As I mentioned, that then will roll into the office demand. And as that picture becomes clearer, that'll give investors, lenders, others better sense of what properties can support what investment going forward and what can't. And that sort of middle group with the uncertainty, that'll start to shrink as it moves along. So, Jamie, we saw this week that the FHFA enabled Freddie and Fannie to expand support for rental housing and announcing higher caps for 2025 raising the multifamily loan cap for enterprises to $73 billion. Yes. Every year at this time, FHFA sort of announces what the cap is for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac on their multifamily side, how much multifamily lending they can do. This year, they raised it from $70 billion each to $73 billion each, continuing something that they did last year. There's also an exception for dedicated workforce housing, so they can each get a bit above that. They're a really important part of the market, so you, you want to make sure that they are there, particularly if there is a need for more capital than traditionally is the case, and if other capital sources may not be there. One important piece of, uh, of what the caps have in addition is that they do have the ability throughout the year to be raised. So we and others meet with FHFA on a quarterly basis telling them what's going on in the market, giving them an assessment of the capital demand and supply. And they have in past cases, if there is a need, raise those caps. So, you know, I think I think FHFA is is well aware of the role the GSEs are playing here, how important they've been and wants to make sure that they continue to do that 
while at the same time making sure that they're not really crowding out some of the other capital sources like banks and life companies. You've given us a lot of reasons for optimism as we approach year end and turn the page to 2025. I guess I'm I'm wondering as a, a last question for you is what do you think keeps MBA's members up at night right now? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I think there's always a question in commercial real estate about what's next, what's around the corner and things that folk could be concerned about. I would say that it, it's kind of interesting right now. My sense from conversations with members is that it's less that what's keeping people up at night as what's waking them up in the morning. And I think that optimism, that that sort of desire to go out there and figure out where to get that next deal done, how to deploy their capital in good, safe, secure ways, but getting that money out into the market is really a key driver right now that's, that's making the market probably as interesting as it's ever been in terms of the availability of capital and all the different loan products that are out there for folks. Isn't that refreshing after two years of COVID, a couple of bank failures, concerns about deposit runs, worries about Basel and other things that the worry has now turned to how are we going to make money in 2025? I love where you're going with that. Let me put in a, a plug for MBA. I think it's a terrific organization. They run events throughout the year, the big one being in San Diego every Super Bowl weekend leading into the following week. Tons of bankers out there. It's a fun event. But otherwise, Jamie, how do people reach out to you? How do they find more about MBA and what you do and how you help the organization and banks work together. Yeah, thanks, Vanis. And MBA is just a really neat organization to be a part of. It's got this incredibly broad membership across different capital sources, different roles in the industry, all looking to sort of do as much as they can um, to make the industry as strong as they can. So we are focused on advocacy in Washington. We've got a strong education program. I'm a little partial to our research program myself, but then also all of our conferences and events. So if folks are looking to find out more, they can come to mba.org and really would make a plug for the CREF convention in San Diego in February. Just a, a fantastic opportunity to meet with people across the capital sources, people doing servicing originations, third-party activities, just, just a fabulous way to keep up with what's going on in the market. I got to let you know that at the conference, there's a cabal of about 30 of us that go to a nice cigar bar downtown after all the sessions have ended and the parties have closed out. We'll have to get you and any other podcast listener that wants to join us for a late night cigar. It's a great way to wrap up an evening. We'd love to have you there this year. It's a great invitation. I got invited last year for the first time, and it's a great way to wind down that Monday night party. So for those that are listening and are interested, let us know. And Jamie, we hope you'll stop by for our nightcap and cigar on that Monday night this year. I'm already looking forward to it. Thanks to our producer, Josh Bruning. Please join us every week as our Lightbox team shares CRE news and data in context. You can listen on any of your favorite podcast channels and send your comments or questions to podcast at lightboxre.com. Thank you for listening and have a great week. Let's go.